Good evening, everybody. I don't know whether the downpour of the weather might have kept a few people away, but it's good to see we've got uh, those who um, really want to hear some of the things about uh, God, about the Bible, and um, it's good to see you here this evening. What an amazing downpour we've just had. Uh, I guess the more rain that comes down now, the quicker the sun will come. Is that how it works in Spain? <laughs> Is that how it works in Spain? Lots of rain now, and then the sun will come. I think this is an event. I heard it. This is an event in Spain uh, that has happened the last time, about 120 years ago or something, when March was a complete washout and there was no sun whatsoever. So um, this is a one in a hundred life event. So we're really living life, aren't we? Lots of things are coming upon us in the last two, three, or four years, and many things I'm sure there are to come. And we were there praying for the Ukraine, and it's hard to know how to pray for the Ukraine. We know that in the Bible there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. It's escalating, and we know that it's all going to break out, and, and, and it's going to be horrendous on this earth. And we know that that is coming, and God is in control. But at the same time, we are praying because we want peace to be there. We want people to be saved. We want people to live. We have compassion for one another. And we are told that uh, the greatest law is to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So, of course, we are going to be uh, praying for those who are in desperate need. I guess a lot of historians were glad that uh, the last century uh, disappeared. There was uh, a couple of world wars. It got pretty difficult. There was the Cold War. That got very frightening. And now in 2022, in this new, new millennium, things are going the same way. And it will continue to be that way. Well, um, uh, I'm glad we've had a few laughs because um, it's quite a serious uh, topic tonight. We've been looking at aspects of the gospel, what the Bible says about life, about salvation, about who God is, about his character. And tonight we're going to be touching on uh, two aspects of God's character, God's holiness and God's wrath. And uh, there's a, an old, an old uh, uh, word, isn't there? The word wrath, W-R-A-T-H. And uh, righteous judgment might be another way of saying it. But the first thing I want to say is Jesus never, ever, Jesus never, ever talked to unbelievers about hell. This is topics that are for the Christians. But he did teach his disciples about hell. So we don't want to be hell, fire, and damnation people um, at all, but we do need to know what the Bible says about these things. You'll be very pleased to know that I'm not doing anything on hell this evening. I can see some of you look really distressed. Um, uh, maybe you want me to do some teaching on, on hell. Um, but Jesus never, never spoke to unbelievers about those things. But he does want his disciples to know. And in fact, Jesus said to his disciples that we should have a, a big concern over the evil one who has the power to take our souls into the wrong place. And he was telling his disciples to watch out, to be on the guard, to actually know our adversary. The book of Ephesians tells us to put on the armor of God to fight against the devil's schemes. And if you know the book of Ephesians, you know we are in a spiritual battle. And uh, there's a war going on in heaven, and the war is playing out on the earth, and there's uh, good and there's evil. And I love the Bible because it gives us some great contrasts, such as good, evil, heaven, hell, the righteous, and the wicked. All these uh, words and these, these contrasts are in the Bible, light and dark. Uh, they're all in Scripture. And so, um, as we started this, and I, I didn't have a stocking filler um, to do something perhaps a, a little bit less serious, we're going to have a look uh, over the next two weeks at uh, God's holiness and actually God's wrathfulness. Um, we've all read the Bible, haven't we? We all read the Bible. We know that God is a God of righteous judgment. So, if you don't like the word wrath, because that's kind of an old word that's like, oh, then just put his righteous judgment. Okay, his righteous judgment. So last time we met, we decided that Christianity is not a religion. Do you remember that study? It's a couple of weeks ago. Helen and I had the opportunity to celebrate her, her birthday. I won't say which one. She doesn't look it. Her 60th birthday in England. And the sun shone. I can't believe it. The sun shone 
bright. We sat outside. We sat outside with our cooked breakfast in England. It was wonderful. So we, we, we left in rain and we came back to rain. Uh, but last time, a few weeks ago, we decided that Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with the living God through the person Jesus Christ. The Bible is all about uh, Jesus, isn't it? All for Jesus. Everything is about Jesus. And we said that Christianity is a relationship because God becomes real and active in our lives when we say yes to Jesus. We call this being born again being born again from above by the Holy Spirit. And we looked last time that when we say yes to Jesus, whether we feel like it, whether we fully understand it, when we repent of our sins and we come to Jesus in faith for who he is, what he's done, dying on the cross for our sins, we become born again from God above. The Spirit of God comes and dwells in us and we experience a change of state. And that's why at Salt Church, for the five years I've been here, I say, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're no longer a sinner by nature. You are a saint by nature who occasionally sins. And we have Jesus in heaven who is praying for us and interceding so that when we do sin as a Christian, we confess our sin, we repent of our sin, and we're forgiven our sin. And our sins are as far as the east is from the west. So when we become a Christian, and no other religion has this, no other philosophy of man has this, when we become a Christian, we have a changed status. Our, our state has changed. Our condition has changed. The Bible would put it in these terms. The old man has gone, and the new man has come. And if I'm going to be politically correct, the old person has gone, the new person has come. Now, when this happens, our spirit comes alive to God. Our mindset should now be changing to have the mindset of Jesus Christ. And then we have the power of the Holy Spirit who is in us and upon us when we're baptized in the Spirit to live the Christian life. But this does beg the question, what happens if the world does not become Christian by rejecting God? And the Bible talks about the righteous and the wicked. So over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to have to get a really tough look. But I'm going to do this in a very nice way. Uh, and uh, hopefully be very careful over my language so that we don't have any misunderstandings. We're going to have a look uh, at the depths of the character of God. Um, God has a character. Um, uh, the character of God, holiness, is a sign of his character. Okay, truthfulness is, is a sign of his character. God cannot lie. But there are two sides of his character that I want us to think about which are both holy. It's just the way they're presented as a human being, we can panic about it. And the two sides of God that I want us to look at is God's holiness and also God's wrath. It seems to me that we cannot understand the true gospel until we have grasped, to some degree, the two sides of God. And more, you will understand more and more as we go through. Uh, this is an introduction, and then I'll be bringing a lot more scriptures next week. Um, I think that we need to have an understanding of God's holiness, and out of his holiness, his righteous judgments which the Bible does use the word wrathfulness, um, we cannot understand. We need to understand these sides of God to have a full appreciation and understanding of certain doctrines such as the judgments of God and the doctrine of hell. In the old days, of course, the wrath of God was preached an awful lot. Or at least you had the Old Testament-style prophets with the billboard, you know, repent, for the end is near, the wrath of God is coming. And uh, we, we've all seen some of that. Um, I don't know if you've seen it personally, but we all know that that is how the church, or as parts of the church, have tried to share the gospel. Um, I don't think it's necessary. We're not here to frighten anybody into the gospel. We're here to love everybody into the gospel. Um, but in the old days, that's the way this was, was preached. Um, but I have to say, in our modern day, particularly in our Western world, 
How many sermons or teachings have you heard on the judgment of God and the wrath of God? Has any hands up? How many hands up have you heard of it? Some have. There are some who have. Now, if you read your Bible, if you are reading your Bible, um, I mean, Jenny, my sister, she reads the Bible through cover to cover. Who don't mind me using it as an example? Uh, she reads the Bible through, all the way through, from the beginning to the end, once a year at least. Uh, plus, she does other studies. And so she's immersed in the Word of God. And when you read it in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, you cannot avoid some of this tough stuff that God says in His Word about His judgment is coming and about how He sees this world, how He sees wickedness, how He sees evil, and how He sees sin. And we cannot avoid it. So I'm hoping we have people who are reading their Bibles and none of this will be a shock or a surprise. Some of it might be an offense. I, I am offended by sometimes the things I read in the Bible. Is anybody else offended by what they read in the Bible? Are there aspects or things you say, whoa, that's too harsh? I mean, there was a time when the disciples came to Jesus and he, he had said to them, teaching about his flesh, his body and his blood. If you don't eat of me or drink of me, you have none of me. They were confused. They didn't understand. They said, this is a hard teaching. And they, they started to leave him. And Jesus even turned to Peter, I think it was, and said, are you going to leave me as well? And Peter said, there's nowhere else I can go. You have the words of eternal life. Either way we look at it, to the world and to us, the Bible has offensiveness in it. Or is it only me who gets offended? I wish I could scrub stuff out. I wish I could take stuff out. But I know that I can't. And I know that I need to understand it. And when I do understand it, I think what shines through is the love of God, the desire of God to actually get people to turn to him in repentance and to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. So um, we've done some teaching on the Laodicean church. Uh, we've done the teaching that the church of Laodicea really is about the people who are sitting like this congregation wanting to believe what they want to believe, wanting to hear what they want to hear, so that each of us make up the truth about God according to our truth. The church of Laodicea means the church of the laity, where everybody makes up and has their own God, and maybe takes bits of the Bible they like and leaves bits out. And uh, that is the way the church goes in the end time. So within the church, there's going to be a lot of um, conflict. And uh, for me, um, we see, if, if you watch, does, who watches lots of um, stuff from America? Yes, yeah, some of you might do. I mean, you only have to look at the God channel, and what you'll get on God channel is motivational preaching. You can command it, you can have it. God's grace covers anything. Nowadays, you don't need to so much repent. We can live more or less how we like. There's a bit of a message that says God's going to give us everything. We're all going to be happy. But I have to say, the Ukrainian Christians at the moment, I don't think they're, they're naming it and claiming it. I don't think they're going for the promotion. I don't think they're going for the new car. I think they're saying, my God, my God, I need water. My God, my God, I need food. And people are dying around them. It's horrendous. And I think on a planet like ours, there's going to be different aspects of the gospel which is going to be picked up by different societies. We are so fortunate, aren't we, to live the way we live. And it's so easy for us to actually turn to all the good things and to kind of miss out a bit on some of the hardships or the real serious bad things. But this is going on on the world. It's the same God of the Ukrainian Christian as the same God as, as me and you. And yet they are going through what seems like hell in their country. And... Um, and so, we know that uh, where we live, you might have a different view on the gospel. We are highly westernized, and motivational stuff has gone all over the world. But there's another side to the Bible. There's the tough side of God. There's the challenging side of God. God desires that no one perish, but that all come to... God desires no one perishes, but that everyone comes to repentance. Repentance. And so, basically, the gospel has a heart of repentance. 
coming to God, saying I'm sorry, and all of those things. But I want us to start by defining the word gospel, and don't worry about when I say spell, okay? That sounds like woo magic stuff. But let's get an understanding of the word gospel. Originally, the word gospel is an Anglo-Saxon word that simply means God's spell. God's spell. Later, it began to mean good news. But what I want to say about God's spell is any spell from God is good. Yeah? God can only do, only do holy things. God cannot do unholy things. But the origin of gospel actually is from God's spell. The Greek word for gospel is eugelion, euangelion, not very good at the Greek pronunciation, but it means a good message. It means a good message. So gospel means a good message or good news. Who has a good news Bible? Yay. So the good news Bible is trying to put the good news of the Bible in simple, easy to understand language. Okay, good news Bible. So gospel means a good message or good news. It also means to announce good tidings. To announce good tidings. What do you do at Christmas? The angels come to the shepherds and they announce good tidings. Because as we know, the gospel is a person, Jesus Christ the Lord. Jesus uh, was born and good tidings have come to men. So the gospel means good news, good tidings. But out of the good tidings, out of the good news, there is a reward for believing those good tidings. What is the reward for becoming a Christian? Eternal life. Are there any conditions? Are there any conditions on attaining eternal life? What do we have to do to attain eternal life? We can only attain eternal life through the person Jesus Christ. We can't go under him. We can't go around him. We can't go over him. We have to go through him. He is the door. We've done lots of sermons on this. He is the door, isn't he? He is the one through whom we come, through whom we receive forgiveness, and then we know God as our heavenly father. So, there is a reward for believing in Jesus. The gospel gives us the reward of eternal life. However, correspondingly, correspondingly, what is there when we reject Jesus? What happens when there's a rejection of Jesus? So the gospel is more than just good news. It's a reward of good tidings, And it brings us into the kingdom of God. We receive salvation. We have eternal life. Hallelujah. And that's the message of the gospel. Come to Jesus. Receive eternal life. Amen. Now the English word, the English word gospel comes from the Latin word evangel. From which we get the word evangelism. So gospel has an evangelism side to it. Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world, bringing people through repentance to know Jesus and then baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so evangelism means to share the good news of the gospel and all the good tidings. So in the New Testament, gospel denotes the good tidings of the kingdom of God, salvation in Christ received by faith, on the basis that he died in our place. So he took on him what I deserved. Do we truly believe that, church? Do we really believe that? So when we sing, in Christ alone my hope is found, yeah, and then when we get, the wrath of God is satisfied. On, on, on him, the sin of all of us is laid. And the wrath of God is satisfied. Do we truly understand what that means? It means, to reiterate, the gospel is this. The wrath of God, which is on humanity, it fell on Jesus Christ. It should fall on me. 
It will fall on me unless I come to Jesus and I am in Christ. Only in Christ am I seen in a holy way by God. My sins are forgiven. And this is the sharpness of the gospel. And this is a real challenge to the world, isn't it? And actually, it's becoming a challenge in the church as well. Now, the word gospel appears in the, in the Bible about 11 times. And um, having to teach and to defend the true gospel is not new. Right from the very start, the apostles were having to defend the gospel. Galatians 1, 6 to 7 says this. This is Paul speaking to the Galatians. I'm astonished that you so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Do you remember a, week, a couple of weeks ago I said there are many gospels? And one of the things, uh, one of the challenges is, if we're not careful, we'll make up our own gospel and we'll block it. This is a gospel according to Chris Knight and it will be different to maybe Dave's gospel or even my wife's gospel. But actually what we're trying to get to is what is the gospel of the scriptures? Now in the first century, the apostles were battling two wicked false gospels. The first one was legalism and the second one was Gnosticism. Legalism. Is it only me who really likes things to go my way? Is it only me? You know, I wanted to go my way. And, and, and you know, legalism is, is really about taking something and then you use it as a stick. You can take something that is good and you can use it as a stick. Legalism in Jesus' day was this. The religious leaders and the teachers of the law, they took the law of God and they used it in an improper way. They used it to, to hit the people and to control the people. And that is religion. So legalism leads to religion. And so what then started to happen, this is what Jesus was born into, is that justification or salvation from God came through works rather than by grace. Legalism is something which really binds people up and it can take you over in a very, very serious way. And it's, uh, it's something which the, the apostles were fighting against. And Jesus fought against the religious leaders because they were legalistic. At one point, I think he said, you know, you, you do your washing of your pans. You know, you washing in your pans is more important than someone who's dying in the street, that type of thing. That's in paraphrase, mixing up two different stories, but don't worry about it. Uh, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis. It means knowledge or hidden knowledge. And um, examples of false teaching is this, the separation of the physical and the spiritual. You'll remember the Nicolaitans, won't you, from Revelation. They separated the physical. They said the physical is all bad. Uh, only the spiritual is good. Therefore, you can do... You, they're separate. So whatever you do in the body doesn't affect you spiritually. Therefore, live however you want to. It doesn't matter. If your spirit's okay, you're fine. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says come to your, 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 in a sin nature, you're cut off from God, come to Jesus, receive the Spirit of God, and then live the life that Jesus lived. Put to death your own things and live Jesus' life and so Gnosticism, you know, so Christians could go to an orgy one time and then go to church the next time and everything was fine. That's Gnosticism. A second thing was, um, well, actually one of them which did, has cropped up, this cropped up in the Church of England when the, the lightning bolt hit York Minster, I think it was. Do you remember that? Clear blue sky, all of a sudden there's a lightning bolt because an archbishop said, that, um, that Christ didn't really die on the cross. It wasn't really a physical death or a physical resurrection. It was only an illusion. It was, it was only a supposition. It didn't really happen physically. 
uh, the crucifixion was really a cruxy fiction. Fiction, not reality. Of course, the Bible says if Jesus didn't die physically, if he didn't rise physically, we're to be pitied of all men because our faith, our faith is rubbish. He can't help us. He can't save us. And so there have been many challenges, and the whole Bible, when you read your Bible, think behind what you're reading. What was the problem in this passage? You know, what were, what were they fighting against? What was the schism in the passage that the Bible is, is writing into and overcoming? You will, you will see that it, it's, it's rife with it. It's rife with it. Have you heard of the Gnostic Gospels? There are many Gnostic Gospels. I, I meet many Christians who say, oh, have you, have you read the, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? Wow, it's fantastic. I meet people who profess to be Christians, and, and they say, what about the Gospel of Thomas? Wow, there's some great stuff in it. These are Gnostic Gospels, and they're made up of 52 texts that were discovered in Nag Hammadi in Egypt. They include secret Gospels, poems, and myths attributed to Jesus in his sayings, which are very different to the New Testament, okay? They are excluded from the Bible, but people, even Christians, are fascinated by them. The Gnostic Gospels were discovered late in December 1945. So we've gone really well without them. Then when they come, people in churches get interested, and all of a sudden you get drawn into something different, and you come away from the true gospel. Um, so they were discovered in December 1945 by an Arab peasant called Muhammad, uh, and they were found, well, ha 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 Muhammad, and they were found in caves in utter Egypt. They went on the black market. They have a big history, and, um, um, and then a man called Professor Gillis Quispel He's, from, he's Dutch, it's a hard word to pronounce. He tracked them down, and he worked out the first line on the fragment that he found, it read these words. These are the secret words which the living Jesus spoke and which the twin Judas Thomas wrote down. That's how uh, a Gothic gospel Gnostic gospel starts. And the thing is, is that whenever you hear about secret words, whenever you hear about or uncover something that is hidden, the Bible describes that as occult. It's not from God. It's actually from the pit of hell. Satan, the devil, hates the true gospel, so he tries to attack it each and every way, and he tries to destroy it. One of the best ways is through deception through giving people what their itching ears want to hear and leading them astray. And the danger is we end up in a false gospel. Who's heard of John Lennon? Here's a quote by John Lennon. He said this, It seems to me that the only true Christians were the Gnostics who believed in self-knowledge, i.e. becoming Christ themselves, reaching the Christ within. The light is the truth. Turn on the light, all the better to see you with, my dear. Do you know, even today, even today, there are doctrines in the church that would say that you and I are little Jesuses, just like John Lennon is saying, that we can do absolutely every single thing that Jesus can do. Uh, it's, called, it's called the little Christ doctrine. And out of that doctrine, we can name things and claim things and and God has to do them. This is a heresy in the church, one which John Lennon seemed to be aware of, but it comes from Gnosticism. It comes from Gnosticism. Now, we know that John Lennon was into Eastern mysticism, and he's famous. What's he famous for from a Christian perspective? He said a, he said a sentence. He said, the Beatles are more popular than Jesus Christ. Do you remember... He made that statement. It's just like, it's just like the, the engineer who designed the Titanic. He said, not even God can sink the ship. And uh, there you go. 
I don't know why, I don't know why so many famous movie and pop stars are so caught up in the mystics such as Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, but they are. But it seems to me that people are searching, but what they're searching for is what they're itching here, ears. They're searching for what they want to hear for themselves. And uh, they are offended by the real truth, but they're not finding the real truth. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, I mean, this is so, so real. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The gospel is about a person, Jesus Christ, the way to salvation. And the spiritual battle is that the devil hates Jesus. He hates you. He hates me. He hates the true gospel. He hates the true believer. And he doesn't want anybody to find the truth. He doesn't want anybody. So he blinds them. He can blind them with science. He can blind them with religion. He can blind them with all sorts of things. And tr it's true. We're in this big battle. I would also add that sadly, quite often, people prefer to believe the lie than the truth. It's actually what they want to believe, and that's really tragic. You know, I have shared the gospel with countless people, particularly in a prison, and it's so, so sad. You see the blindness. You can have the argument. You can do all sorts of things. But to penetrate through, not everyone is going to believe, and they're not, for a whole host of reasons. So we are in a spiritual battle. Uh, the number of times that I have offended people because the gospel offends, um, you know, I can count on my bedpost. And the reason why it offends people is this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, I said there's two classes of people. There's Jew and Gentile. There's the righteous, there's the wicked. Here, we have those who are perishing and those who are being saved. The Bible does this. It's such a clear-cut contrast. The Bible makes it clear. There's one path and there's another path. And that's it. We don't need to complicate it by saying everyone can get there through the gray. It's not. It's actually black and it is white. And here in this, in this passage here, we have two sides of the cross. We have the two sides of the gospel. There is a perishing and there is a saving. And it all depends on our response to the cross, to Jesus. We cannot avoid it. The Bible is so clear on it. And rejection, rejection sees it as foolishness and offensive, but it leads to perishing. Acceptance of this gospel leads to being saved and seeing the power of God in the gospel. Hallelujah. I know I'm teaching you to suck eggs. I'm sure that none of this is new to anybody here I'm sure other scriptures are coming to you as you speak because I'm sure you know your Bibles. But sadly, some Christians, for example, do not like the God of the Old Testament, so they won't even read it. There, is some famous, there are some famous American uh, pastors. There's one in my mind at the moment. I won't name because it's not about naming. But he will not teach or preach or read the Old Testament only the New Testament. He has a good reason for it. He has a good reason for it. One is old, the other is new. I live under the New Testament. The trouble is, is the world, if you're not a Christian, you're living under the Old Testament. You need to come into the New Testament. And, so, and to understand the whole of the Bible, you can't leave out two-thirds of it because it explains the New Testament. Do we know that? Are we on board? But sadly, some Christians, they, they won't read or do anything with the Old Testament. However, I wonder what they think when they get to the book of Revelation. I mean, the, Revela the book of Revelation, we had, a, we had a prayer, didn't we? And we had a prayer that we know there's going to come a time 
when a third of the population of this planet is consumed in death, war, destruction, consumed by famine, hunger, thirst, a third of the planet is going to be wiped out. Now, I guess we don't want to hear this, do we? But that's what is in the Bible. And, I, and I'm sure you'll read it. Who's read Revelation recently? Yeah? I mean, the reason why I'm doing this study is because five years ago, I said, what do you want to hear about? Revelation, Revelation, the end time. It came up a lot. What about hell? A lot of these subjects came up. And we're sort of getting to some of them uh, now. But I wonder what people feel who are like that, who want to cut out the bad bits when you get to the book of Revelation. Because it's God who pours out. It's the angels who pour out. They pour out the balls. It's, it's God who is bringing and widening this earth up. It is God who is, is ex executing his holy righteous judgment on the earth. Enough has been enough, he says. Now, I don't know uh, how you feel, but, but, but I'd rather not experience that. And I'm saying, God, my prayer is... God, hold off. God, hold off doing that. Wait, because more people could get saved. Hold off, God. Hold off on this judge. I know it's coming, but please hold off so that the gospel can save people and more come into the kingdom. And, and that's my heart. But of God, of course, God knows who's in the kingdom. God knows the right time when it's going to end. I don't. But my prayer is, God, please hold off. Let's try and get people saved. Amen? God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no shadow of turning in Him. And that's why in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we have got the wrath and judgment of God. It's more seen in the Old Covenant instantly, although the love of God and the promises of God are there. And then we have the love of God in Christ Jesus, which is more seen in the New Covenant, but then the judgments of God are there in the end times. So he is consistent throughout his book. The church of Laodicea is a church where churchgoers want to pick and choose the nice bits and um, reject the tough bits or not hear about the tough bits. Actually, Robert MacDonald mentioned that in one of his sermons. Romans 1.16, what is the gospel? Romans 1.16, the true gospel, of course, is good news. Of course, means good news, as we have said. The gospel means good work, good news, and there are rewards of eternal life for believing in it. However, if the gospel is good news, is there not bad news that, that, that should be understood? If there's good news, isn't there bad news, or is it only good news? Hallelujah, we're all in heaven, we're all saved, that, that's really good news. But it wouldn't be good news, it would be normal news. There would be nothing extraordinary about it. The gospel is good news, and it has benefits by believing. But if there is good news, then actually the other side of the coin, or the other side, is bad news. And the bad news, which is in the Bible, you can't avoid it. The bad news is written in the Bible. There are consequences if the gospel is rejected. There are consequences if Jesus is rejected. So the good news uh, is, put this way, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. So the gospel is the power of God. It has a purpose. The purpose of the gospel is the power to save sinful people. The gospel is received in only one way, by believing in it. There's no other way to, to be saved. We have to believe in the person, Jesus Christ, and have a relationship with him. And we, we always say we're saved as Christians. We're saved. I'm saved. You're saved. And we love it. But what are we saved from? Being saved means we've been saved from something doesn't it? So I'm saved, but what am I saved from? And the church at the moment in lots of, well, I don't know. I don't know how many sermons we've heard on what am I saved from. I guess it's for us in private to read it in the Bible. But Jesus wanted his disciples to know the truths about 
what we are also saved from, and then we have a better appreciation of the gospel. In a nutshell, what is it that we're saved from? Have you thought through this? We're saved from death. Yes, remember I did some teaching on, on death. Uh, I did some teaching on death, didn't I? Do you remember that? I talked about physical death, and I talked about spiritual death. I talked about eternal death, and I mentioned that death is a, a separation. The spirit lives forever, but eternal life is the spirit being with God for eternity. Eternal death is the spirit being alive and perishing, but in hell. Do you remember the teaching? So we know the gospel. We've been teaching the gospel all, all the way along. But what is it that we're really being saved from? Have you ever thought about this? My, my, my sister's teaching me. Uh, we are saved from God's wrath. When was the last time you read Romans chapter 1 to 3? Go home and read Romans chapter 1 to 3. Next week, I'll be showing six, six aspects of God's wrath and, what, and actually the importance of knowing about them. One, they're in the Bible, but it's good for us to understand this. You see, the good news is in Christ Jesus, we get saved from the wrath and judgment of God. Have you ever seen it that way before? Yeah. The good news of the gospel is that in Christ Jesus, he took the wrath instead of me. When I become a Christian and I'm forgiven by Jesus covered in his blood, the wrath of God passes over me like it does at the Passover. And so I remember giving my testimony. I remember giving my testimony, which is this exact story that as an intelligent guy hearing the gospel being preached in, 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 a, in a multitude of ways, I came to a place when I realized I was living under the old covenant, I was living under the judgment and the wrath of God. And all I received from that, when I knew that, I received something powerfully from the Holy Spirit. Because this is what the Holy Spirit does. When the light bulb goes on, the Holy Spirit says, there's your savior. His name is Jesus. Go to Jesus. You can, you can get out of this and be saved. Thanks for the clap. Thank you. But that is, that is the realization. I, I learned right early about the wrath of God and living under judgment. Everything I was deserving, Jesus took. He was the fall guy. And I tell you what, when I understood that, whoa, Jesus goes right up. Jesus is lifted high. And, and, and Jesus is, is right up there. And he did it for those who would believe. Now, Jesus is a human being. He is commanded to love every human being. Jesus loves everyone. Every single person. He died for the whole world. But he cannot force people to believe. And he cannot change God's holy, righteous judgment. He can't change that. God desires that no one perish, but all through repentance come to Christ. And so... I realize that the good news at a, at a very fundamental, basic level in Scripture is we are saved, actually, from the wrath of God. Jesus took the wrath, and we saw how ugly it was. We, saw, we can see it if you've seen the passion. It's horrendous. And I gave another testimony. I sat there watching this film on my own. And I tore my clothes. I said, my God, my God, how can you do this to your son? And the spirit rose up in me and said, I did it for you. Your sin is that serious. You're living under this punishment. But my son took it for you. This is the gospel. Before the world was brought into being, Christ died for those who would believe. Amen? Amen. 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 So I think the greater appreciation actually we have of the bad news, actually, if I know what I've been saved from, boy, I, I, Jesus is, is elevated, man. And I don't like anyone who brings Jesus down or tries to minimize Jesus or what Jesus did on the cross. I don't, I don't like bringing Jesus down. I don't like taking the love of God and, and actually bringing that down. 
the love of God is, is only discovered and, and, and shown in Christ. And actually, I'm going to show a picture from Jenny's Life Bible next week, which actually gives a lovely contrast and a great summary of what I'm trying to say. But the greater the appreciation coming to a close, fairly soon, really soon, the greater the appreciation I think we have of some of the bad news and an understanding of God's righteous judgment, then the more I can understand and be, uh, be appreciative of my salvation. I don't know if you feel like that yourself. But if I know what I'm saved off, I appreciate the Savior a bit more. And um, uh, the, 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 bad, the, the bad news or the other side of the gospel is God's wrath. Now, the, the gospel means good news, and so as Christians, we always put it in a good format. We put it as good news. But we are being saved from God's wrath. Did you know, this is controversial but biblical, did you know that God is very angry and he's wrathful? The word wrath means extreme anger. Wrath means extreme anger. So what is God so angry about that invokes his wrath? Well, one of them, one of them, is sin. One of them is sin. God is angry against sin. What does sin do? What does sin do? Sin cuts us off immediately from God. Who's done Alpha Course? The ABCs of the faith. Sin cuts us off from God. We're separated from God. We're not known in the right way by God. We're cut off. We become polluted by sin. The world is polluted. You know, I don't know how you feel about what's going on in, in, in the Crimea. <laughs> Crimea, well, that, hopefully that's not prophetically the next one, uh, in the Ukraine. How do you feel about what's going on? Do you feel a righteous anger? Have you ever felt really angry at the injustice of something that's going on in the world? Have you been shaking? Have you even shouted at God at it? How can this happen? Human beings, we're made in the image of God. We understand in our limited sinful way what righteous anger is. We experience it. It rises up in us and we are justifiably angry at what has happened. So if you and I understand a little bit about righteous anger, then hopefully we can understand that out of God's holiness, everything is, is holy and pure and right when this world is messed up the way it is, now you understand why God is angry. He's angry at sin. He's angry at, at, at mistreating people. He's angry at, at, at the systems of this world. He's angry at what Satan has done. And we know what's going to happen to Satan, don't we? His head's going to be squashed, and for eternity he's banished to the lake of fire. God is angry. Sin entered through disobedience and sin entered through rebellion. We are a rebellious people. Human beings are a rebellious people, are we not? We are born in rebellion. The Bible calls that original sin. We have an original condition. We're not born believing in God and we're not born saved. We are born in original sin. And Jesus died to take that original sin away and to forgive everything we've ever done, past, present, and future. And so, and so God is really angry at what is happening in this world. Sin has brought death. Do you know, God is really angry that death is here. God never intended us to die. He gave one rule to Adam. Don't eat of the fruit, because you'll die. One rule, he couldn't even keep that. But I couldn't even keep that either. If it was you or me in the garden, we'd make the same mistake. We would do the same thing. We would fall the same way, wouldn't we? And we would. So I don't blame Adam, although the Bible says, all who are in Adam die. You need to be in the new man, Jesus Christ, to live for eternity. Jesus is known as the new Adam. Amen. It's a bit flowing tonight, isn't it? Now then, God is angry. He's angry at sin. He's angry at Satan. He's angry at the war. He's angry at injustice. We know that God has extreme love, don't we? God is extreme love. God is love. 
you know, God's love for his son was so vast and so wide. And yet what did God have to do to his son for you and me to come in? Whoa. I mean, that actually, that's why I was angry. Because I'm looking at this in human terms. I'm seeing it humanly. God's seeing it eternally. But it broke his heart. And it broke Jesus when Jesus said, my God, my God, where are you? You know, Jesus really knows what it is to be human. He experienced being cut off from God, cut off from his Father. And that's because at that point, he became sin for us. He loves the world so much. He loves his neighbor so much. He died for everyone, but only those who believe and receive and accept know the fullness of what this is all about. Amen? Amen. So where there is extreme love, there is perfect love. But where there's extreme love, there is perfect righteous anger that actually flows from the heart of love. Can you understand that? This is a fundamental, important thing. Out of an extreme love comes a righteous anger that the Bible calls wrath because of what happens, what people do to what God loves. So I, it's hard to explain. I don't know. I'm an artist. If I spend a lot of time doing a masterpiece and then someone came along, chucked some paint on it and cut it up, how am I going to feel? Am I... Am I, am I, am I right in my love for what I've created? Am I right in grabbing hold? Maybe not slapping him. <laughs> but even in that, we're wimps. Even in that, we're wimps. Because in the whole scheme of things, the judgment of God is going to separate us into two places. So, you know, we can still be wimpish. But um, yes, in the human sense, not to slap him. But I have a righteous anger. It's wrong. I want retribution. I want justice. I want justice. Now, if the person comes, he's sorry, he repents, he's deeply sorry, not, oh, I'm sorry, but he shows he's sorry. His, his life and repentance over a period of time proves that he is sorry, then I might have a different attitude to forgive. I might find it hard to forgive. Corey ten boom. Corey ten boom. In, a, in, in, in Outswitch and all of those things, the officer who killed her family, many years later, walked into a church where she was talking. He'd become a Christian. She recognized him, he recognized her. He walks down and he said, I'm sorry, I've become a Christian. And she is severely challenged with her righteous anger. But Christ forgave her her sin. And she had Christ in her, and he had Christ in him. And they made an amazing forgiveness. But actually, if the person doesn't come down, there's still that righteous judgment against the person for what the actions have happened. I tried to explain it, but you need to think about it. So for God's love to be perfect, there has to be perfect judgment and perfect wrath. There has to be. I hope you can see that. More about it next week. So to look at it another way, out of God's holiness comes God's extreme, unfathomable, immeasurable, boundless love. Now, you know I got that from a, uh, a Christian dictionary, <laughs> okay? And at the same time, to give love its rightful place, we must recognize God's extreme, unfathomable, immeasurable, and boundless wrath the second half of the quote from a Christian theological book, okay? God is holy. What does holiness mean? Yeah, only two pages. God is holy. What holiness means is that God has moral and ethical wholeness or perfection. God is free from all moral evil. 
Holiness is one of the essential elements of God's nature, which is also required of his people. Holiness may be rendered sanctification or godliness. The word holy denotes that which is set apart for divine service. So as a Christian, we are set apart for divine holy service of God. <clears throat> but out of God's holiness comes a divine righteous anger and a righteous judgment against all that is evil, all that is sinful, all that is morally wrong with equal force. Have I sold that to you? It makes logical, perfect sense. Grace is found in Christ Jesus alone. The grace of God is found in Christ. So we, hallelujah, have avoided the wrath of God. We've received the grace of God in Christ and all the benefits of the gospel. Amen. So I have to say, it's an, you know, God is angry. He is wrathful. And God's wrath, quote, uh, is the personal manifestation of God's holy moral character in judgment against sin. Wrath is neither an impersonal process, nor is it irrational and fitful like anger. It is in no way vindictive or malicious. It is holy indignation. God's anger directed against sin. When we are angry, we can have malice against it. We can have wrong motive against it. We can abuse our anger. But God's anger comes from his holiness. It's always right, without malice. It's not vindictive. It's not any of those things. It's a holy, righteous wrath. That is the wrath of God. So God's wrath is an expression of his holy love. And this is important, coming to a close. If God is not a God of wrath, his love is no more than frail, worthless sentimentality. The concept of mercy is meaningless. And the cross was a cruel and unnecessary experience for his son. C.S. Lewis had an awful lot to say about that. God's wrath is an expression of his holy love. If he's not a God of holy wrath, his love is no more than a frail worth of sentimentality. The concept of mercy is meaningless. And for me, and th this has cropped up in recent history, the cross would be a cruel and unnecessary experience. But it isn't a cruel and necessary experience. The cross is the highest thing anyone can do. It's the greatest thing in human history. We're coming to Easter, we're celebrating the cross. This study is good timing, very good timing. We're coming to when Christ is on that cross. And it's not a cruel and unnecessary thing. It is very necessary for the likes of you and me. And God loved and saw you and me in Christ Jesus that it was worth the death of his son. And Jesus went to the cross because he could see the benefit after the cross. He had an eternal perspective. We've got to stop bringing God down to our human perspectives. God's different to us. His ways are different. And yet we can understand the great love of God in Christ that allows a sinful, born sinful person cut off from him to find a way to our home in heaven. Amen? Amen. So the conclusion, the conclusion. These are big issues. It's interesting to face up to them. We can't go too fast. I'll do a bit more in development of the themes, um, a few more bones uh, next week. But I still passionately believe we cannot fully appreciate or understand the good news of the gospel unless we understand the bad news by which I mean the bad news of rejecting the gospel. It seems to me that understanding this to some measure will help us understand the full force of what we've been saved from and then we will understand better the reason why 
the wrath of God is satisfied in the death of his own son, Jesus Christ. And we will put Jesus high in his rightful position. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.